As the mist clears on a new day, Yuri Dubik flies to work. His office for the next few hours, a giant Soviet-built helicopter, will take him to a world of awesome but dangerous beauty. In Kamchatka, creation has not yet ended. При этом это чувствуется не только по вулканам, но и по землетрясениям, которые здесь часто довольно происходят часто. Если для нас это приятно все, потому что мы профессионалы, мы работаем с вулканами, то для тех, кто населяет эту землю, это ну это опасность, это серьезная опасность. Yuri first came here as a young scientist 32 years ago. He's been captivated ever since. The Lua was a chain of almost 500 volcanoes. Yuri took me over some of the 29 that are still active. Their immense subterranean heat sending steam through the ice and snow. Our destination was a volcanic lake named Karimsky, recently covered by fresh lava after a giant eruption. It was exceptional um, uh, eruption because the eruption took place here. All this lake was boiled and steaming. After two and a half years, it's still steaming. Yeah, and uh, the lake is still warmer than it should be. Until recently, Yuri could rarely share his passion for Kamchatka or even use the rudimentary English his mother taught him as a child. So, for example, this is uh, a real Moon surface, you're right. Mm -hmm. With small craters, with boulders, and all things. Amazing place. For the West, it might as well have been on the moon. There were no foreigners among the small, closed community of scientists, fishermen, and military. Kamchatka was a spectacle of nature sealed off by politics. If the world had gone to war, it would probably have started here. Radar stations tracked the North Pacific sky, ready to alert MiG fighter jets for quick and merciless attacks. The peninsula was dotted with military bases and a nuclear-powered fleet. Even Soviet citizens needed special permits to visit. Like most of Russia, Kamchatka can no longer rely on the state it defended. The military are still here, but troops and officers are lucky to even get their wages. The 270,000 residents of the capital, Petropavlovsk, have felt the collapse of the Soviet state harder than most. Bureaucrats in distant Moscow, nine time zones to the west, did nothing to prepare them for life after the Cold War. But Kamchatka's authorities believe Moscow's neglect may prove to be its salvation. The legacy of military occupation is that their environment is almost unspoiled. The years of military restrictions kept out development as well. Я, наверное, назвал бы счастьем то, что вот то, что разрушалось в России многие десятилетия, не дошло до Камчатки. Завтра во второй половине дня. Vice Governor Vladimir Balakayev has a dream. It's not of helicopters transporting troops or volcanologists, but wealthy, even armed, Western tourists. Время показало нам, что мы пока не можем привлечь на Камчатку большие группы туризм туристов. Это связано с тем, что вся инфраструктура 
туристическая наша не в полной мере отвечает всем требованиям. Уголки Камчатки сегодня готовы принять туристов со всех углов мира. Начинают туризма любительского, кончают туризмом профессиональным. Это рыбаки. On this second helicopter ride, the passengers were European businessmen holding an out-of-the-way convention. Most were keen on enjoying nature, though some were more intent on killing it. Two of the men had paid $5,000 extra to go bear hunting. As yet, helicopters are the only way to travel around Kamchatka. The Soviet military only built roads to connect their bases, not the remote towns and settlements. But even at this embryonic stage, when tourism is confined to the rich and occasionally bloodthirsty, a small trickle is becoming a steady stream. Until 1941, nobody had ever seen the Valley of the Geysers. The area was so remote it was only discovered after scientists stumbled across it during a long overland trek. Now, as many as four helicopters a day are bringing tourists. Scientists still come to study one of the world's biggest concentrations of geysers and hot springs. But for them, such field trips are now rare events. Their shrinking budgets have to stretch to buying seats on tourist flights. Even so, Yuri shows little resentment that his once exclusive domain has been thrown on the private market. I think this, this peninsula can survive after great earthquakes, eruptions. So I hope it, it can stand <laughs> the, the people too. But it depends on people, of course, on their education, ecological education, on their mentality. Yuri hopes to see visits that go beyond hunting and sightseeing to ecotourism, something that might give work to scientific guides as well as business people. In my experience, I'm, I met mainly, mainly uh, people who are interested in uh, to, to know, to know new things. So they came not only to see the landscapes, beautiful landscapes and volcanoes, but to know more about the earth. And this is this is right place for for this purpose. The concrete horror of the Soviet-built capital, Petropavlovsk, is testament to the Soviet's stunning disregard for the physical environment. Across the Soviet Union, authorities dug up or developed just about everything they could in the process destroying much of the country. The post-Soviet authorities here face a choice. Do they continue to protect the environment at any cost or start digging? The 1,000-kilometre peninsula holds an abundance of minerals and high-quality forests. So far, development has been small-scale, unlike in the rest of Russia, where corrupt local administrations have raced to strip the region's resources and split the proceeds. Vice-Governor Balakayev promises that won't happen here. Первое, что мы сделали на Камчатке, говоря о развитии э, минеральных ресурсов, э, мы э, сказали, что та природа, которая сегодня есть на Камчатке, она должна быть сохранена. Поэтому все э, проекты, которые имеются в золото рудной промышленности на Камчатке, они рассматриваются в первую очередь экологами. И поиск технологий, который сегодня ведется у нас на Камчатке э, через канадские технологии, американские, все прочие, австралийские в том числе, мы говорим, они должны быть безопасны для наших рек, для нашей рыбы на Камчатке, для нашей природы. For once, a local government might actually mean it. The big timber and mining interests have less influence here than in other parts of Russia. 
Kamchatka's isolation and lack of roads make logging and mining much more expensive. A far stronger lobby here is the fishing industry, which is solidly opposed to development. Salmon isn't just abundant here, it's almost embarrassingly easy to catch. And fishermen like Alexander Barayan want to keep it that way. While Russia has lax rules for protecting fish stocks, in Kamchatka they're stronger than anywhere else in the country. Logging can't take place within 300 metres of a river. It's totally forbidden near areas where fish spawn. Like everywhere in Russia, Kamchatka faces an uncertain and precarious future. But this is one place that could rise above the post-communist fate of decline and decay. Simple economics is guiding it towards a post-Soviet rarity, preservation of a wilderness for generations to come.